So I think I'll start then. Bonjour tout le monde. Good morning, everyone. My name is Linda Barber, and I'm the branch manager at the Ottawa branch of the National Association of Federal Retirees. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which the office of the Ottawa branch is situated is traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. On behalf of the Ottawa branch, I'm pleased to welcome you, welcome you to today's webinar titled Benefits of Back Exercises, presented by Meg Stickle Craker, owner of AIM Fitness. And she's brought a wonderful guest speaker with her, and that's Dr. Christine Rad, who's a doctor of chiropractic from the Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College and Ottawa Health Performance and Rehabilitation. Today's webinar with Dr. Rad will cover protecting your back as you spend time this summer gardening and doing other outdoor activities and ways to reduce and prevent back pain. And I have to say, I suffer from that, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what she has to say. Veuillez noter que le webinaire sera présenté en anglais, mais la participation bilingue est toujours encouragée. I want to give a special welcome this morning to anybody here who is not yet a member of the association. Hopefully, maybe you have invited some guests. And our plan here is that you'll find the webinar so interesting that maybe you'll decide to join us. And we'd love to see that happen. And for those of you who are members, of course, we hope the webinar encourages you to maintain your membership. And just a reminder, too, if you, there's someone in your life you'd like to give a gift to, you can give a gift of membership in the association. And we're going to share a link for you that you can click on afterwards to see how that's done. After today's webinar, you're going to get an email from us at Ottawa Branch with instructions on how to access the recording of today's webinar and how to give the gift of membership and other ways to follow up with Meg and with Christine. Uh, there's also going to be a question and answer period at the end of the webinar. And how we'll handle that is we're going to ask you to type in your questions into the chat box. And then at the end of the webinar portion, then uh, Meg and Christine will be answering those questions out loud and you'll get a chance to hear all the answers. But you can put your type your questions in at any point uh, during the presentation. So that's it for me. Now I'm going to turn it over to Meg. All right. Thank you very much, Linda. And welcome, everyone. Nice to have you join us today. So um, I've known Dr. Christine Rad now for a number of years, and we met um, because we, I, uh, myself and another woman, we, we met, we serve older adults. We, we work with a lot of retirees. And we said, you know what, it would be great to meet other women owned businesses. So we connected with Dr. Christine, and she's been a part of our networking group now for a few years. Um, so, and we've done a few, quite a few events over the years as well. So be sure you connect with both of us after if you want to uh, know what our group is doing in the Ottawa area. And then as well, I had a personal experience uh, with Dr. Christine when I had an injury um, two winters ago, I went snowboarding and it'd been a while since I snowboarded and I fell and I, I really injured my shoulder and I went to go and, and see her and, and work with her. And it only took about three or four sessions um, and my shoulder is now back to normal. And it, it took about, I'd say a few months of, um, of doing the exercises that she gave me and um, but it's unbelievable. I fully full range of motion over my shoulder now. So I can attest to uh, Dr. Christine's um, way of, of working with, with individuals and her gentle approach in her chiropractic care. So um, we're going to have the, today very interactive. So I'm going to be monitoring the chat. So as, uh, as Christine is, is uh, presenting, if you do have any questions or you want a, a little bit more in-depth um, knowledge or, or uh, some, some tips based on what we are talking about, I'm going to monitor that so we can do the, the question and answer period um, throughout the presentation as well. So we'd love to hear from you all. All right. So Dr. Christine, I'm going to pass it over to you. All right. Uh, so before we sort of get started with the uh, presentation itself, I just want to say thank you for having me, Meg. It was great that I got that information or the in invitation from you. Um, I am not like most chiropractors. I'll say that right off the bat. Um, as, as Meg might uh, attest to, I do do manipulations or the chiropractic adjustment that many people have heard of, but it's not the only tool in my toolbox. It's a means of getting somewhere, but that we all know there's different roads to to different destinations. Um, so I do offer a lot more. And the number one thing that I tell people is if you're looking for a healthcare Honey. practitioner, um, 
read their bio, go on their website, read what they're all about, see what kind of conditions they like to, to treat or work with or that they have a personal interest in. Um, half of the battle is finding someone that jives with you or that works well with you in terms of just that personality fit. So that'd be my number one recommendation when it comes to finding a chiropractor, just because they are so many different kinds. Some of us like to work with pediatrics. Some of us like to work with sport injuries and others like that geriatric population or, um, people who tend to have, we'll say osteoarthritis, things like that, that prevent them from being active or doing the things that they want to be doing. Um, okay. So I'm going to try and share my screen here. All right. All right, so that's me. So I'm Dr. Christine Rad, doctor of chiropractic as uh, Meg and um, I believe when I got introduced, I do work at Ottawa Health Performance and Rehabilitation. It is a clinic that my partner started during the pandemic. So it's been quite a little bit of a roller coaster. And if you ever need any contact information, please don't hesitate to reach out. So, and what I do hope to tell you guys about today is not only what you can do throughout the summer is gardening, being outdoors, but this goes into every season. Um, and I want you to just hold on to these little tidbits because they are just very general and um, can help depending on whatever scenario you are, I can always give you more information that's a little bit more tailored towards you. And a little bit of a disclaimer, this is not intended as medical advice. This is just to give you a little bit more information about what the research is showing and things that I found success with in my clinical practice. So my very first one that I'll probably tell every single patient when they come in, motion is lotion. <laughs> and this includes for your joints, muscles, and connective tissues. Has anyone ever heard or um, been in, or had anything sort of experience with this or heard this from a different practitioner? I'll let you guys kind of chime in if you want, because I do want you guys to talk during the presentation. Um, there's not too much content, but it is for you guys just to sort of share your ideas. So when we think about motion is lotion, what I usually tell people, and this is specific to joints, because number one uh, complaint I get when people are coming in, especially when they're older, so we'll say over the age of 40 or 50, is that their joints feel stiff, or it takes them a long time to sort of feel normal or able to walk without pain or, or difficulty in the mornings. Um, so the number one thing I always recommend is movement, right? Our joints were literally built to move. And that's the biggest thing that we can do for them to keep them healthy is to move them. So it doesn't have to be a full blown exercise workout that you have to do every day for an hour. It's just movement throughout your day, keeping things regular and steady. Um, but if you do have a physical activity routine that you do, it's even better. And as you'll see in my later slides, it's probably one of the best things you can do. And there's never a moment that's uh, too late to start. So you can always see benefits from it. And what I usually tell patients also is exercise is sort of like that poly pill. There are so many incredible hidden benefits with it in terms of uh, what it can do for your body systemically. So it's not just your muscles and joints, it's everything in terms of hormones, mood regulation, sleep patterns, diet, and even just like cravings, things like that. So exercise does help with that. Um, throughout our past, we have moved a lot. So it wasn't until probably the last 200 years where we started having cars and things like that to bring us or move us around. We did a lot of walking and we did a lot of yard work which included farming, right? Everybody had to farm to get their food. This is movement that typically these days in our modern society, we don't see that sort of movement anymore. And I've seen a lot of patients who over the pandemic, just due to variety of reasons, stop moving. They stayed at home. They didn't get that regular activity that they would have otherwise have gotten going to work or seeing their grandchildren or seeing their friends at their bingo nights, things like that. Um, have you guys experienced that lack of motion throughout the pandemic? I'll open it up to everybody. Hi, Dr. Christine, it's Linda again. 
our audience is uh, on mute, but they might they can type answers to the questions you ask into the chat box. Okay, so I'm not going to be monitoring the chat box much. I'm going to leave that up to Meg. Mm -hmm. um, but if there's a question, Meg, you think that would be kind of pertinent right now, we can go ahead and answer it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's anything in there. Yeah, so yeah, we have a few. Yeah, there's a, a few people who have said, yes, I've kept active. Someone else shares, uh, have had lots of motion, but do spend a lot of time sitting and working. Um, someone else says, no, I've been lucky. I was giving groove dance classes on Zoom. Oh, awesome, Lucy, sounds like fun. Um, Chris shares, for sure, work from home has been brutal on movement, sat all day and then sat all night. Yeah, I know a lot of people who've, who've said that as well. Um, we've got two questions. Um, so the one question from Gordon is, why would knee joints feel loose first thing in the morning? Could it be poor muscle tone? Knee joints feeling loose in the morning? Um, am I, did I hear that correctly, Meg? Mm -hmm, that's right. Feeling loose in the morning could be a variety of reasons. Um, it's really hard to know without an assessment. Um, but that being said, a lot of times stability in our joints, and I don't mean necessarily the clinical sense of your joint is unstable. I just mean in terms of stability as in the ability you have to control your joint motion. That does have a lot to do with that active control of muscular activity. So if you do find that potentially there has been a loss of muscle mass, um, someone like Meg is probably a perfect person to reach out to because she does do a lot of strengthening and exercise work uh, for people who are dealing with muscle loss because that is a natural aging process that does happen um, where muscle mass comes down and the big thing that affects our ability to maintain independence is that strength to move around and take care of ourselves so meg would definitely be the best uh, person to reach out to if you have no clinical pain or injuries or anything like that go right into uh, speaking with meg because she'll give you those uh, those great tips on how to build strength and maintain mobility. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And um, I think many of you know, but not all, that uh, I do have a special discount for all NAFR members. So I have a fitness membership that has over, we, now we've got over 200 exercise videos that you can do at any time of day. And you guys save 33%. So be sure to reach out if you want to know a little bit more about the membership. Um, all right, Roger has a question. Um, can a chiropractor order other diagnostic, uh, diagnostics such as x-rays or MRIs? Uh, currently in Ontario, so this is different depending on the province, but in Ontario, which is the province that I'm licensed in, we have the ability to order x-rays um, and actually take them ourselves if we have an x-ray machine at our clinic. I do not. I typically don't x-ray most of my patients because it's usually not clinically warranted. Unless I'm finding in the examination that the x-ray will change my treatment plan or my diagnosis, then I'll consider it and have the patient get an x-ray before we um, start any treatment. Besides that, ultrasound, MRI, CTs, things like that, they do need a physician to refer. And what I'll often do is I'll refer the patient back to their uh, family doctor, if they have one with a note describing what we found in the exam, what I think they need in terms of imaging moving forward and just like what their best care plan of management might be. Um, but it is up to a physician to get that referral. Unfortunately for MRIs and things like that, it does take a long time to get on that roster. So most times, if it's not something urgent or something that's like outside my scope, for example, that we can start treatments. It's just, we'll get that MRI later to confirm a diagnosis or anything like that. Um, but yeah, if I'm suspecting that something's outside of your muscles, bones and joints and nerves, then yeah, we're definitely getting ex, uh, in increased imaging just to see exactly what's going on. Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, Polly shares uh, that she's kept up with Pilates, laughing yoga, Tai Chi, and chair yoga. Can't imagine how I'd be if I had it. Awesome, that's great to hear. So it seems like there's a mixture of people who definitely have stayed active and continued on um, and maybe adapting workouts online, but um, that's really great to hear from, from everyone. Um, we've got one more question, then we'll move on. Um, so my family doctor is telling me to take Tylenol up to 1200 mgs a day if I have either pain or stiffness. What is your opinion regarding using pills on a daily basis? 
I'll preface this with this is my opinion only. <laughs> um, technically, medications and pharm pharmaceuticals are outside of my scope of practice. I don't have any authority to recommend or tell patients to stop taking medications um, that have been recommended by their family physician. They are the authority on that. However, that being said, ask your physician if they're recommending medications, ask them if there's anything else you can do alongside that right? There are different ways that we can help manage pain or disability or stiffness, whatever it might be. Um, a, a lot of times a combined approach is usually one of the best ones, um, whether it's with exercise or with manual therapy or acupuncture on top of um, different conditions. When you need that medication, it is great to take it sometimes. Um, but that is a discussion privately that we tend to have with either the physician's um, recommendations and things like that, along with that physical exam findings. Okay, awesome. Thanks for sharing that. All right, let's keep going. We'll uh, hit some more questions later. All right. So this is a big one specifically for I, I think there was someone who mentioned that they've been at home working from home a lot and pretty much not moving or not having that same amount of activity. So your best posture is your next posture. Um, this basically underlines the effect that there is no perfect posture. As much as we've been told that sitting upright with our shoulders back and straight spine, that does, it's great if it feels good. Um, but that being said, holding that for an extended period of time, just like any other posture, it really, it doesn't feel good. So your best posture is the next one, which just means that if you want to cross your legs, go for it, switch sides, lean onto one arm, lean onto the other, stand up, walk around, whatever it is that helps you feel better. Um, whether it's you're doing work or cooking or cleaning, leaning into a counter, putting your hand out to load the dishwasher or anything like that. It's changing that position, right? You're redistributing those forces or loads, whatever you would sort of want to uh, refer to them as. Um, that's going to be the best thing for you. And it sort of reiterates that uh, mention of uh, motion is lotion. <laughs> so move around. Things tend to feel looser. And I know this is sort of backwards, but when you use muscles and joints, they tend to feel looser. Um, and that's one of the big things that I tell people because I'll always ask, how is my posture? And I say, your posture is great, but let me see the different ways that you hold your posture in different scenarios, right? As we fatigue, things change. As we're tired, things change. Um, if we're gardening outside and it's a really hot day, things change, right? We get tired quicker or we have an awkward position, which I hear all the time is changing tires. <laughs> that's when people say their back goes out or shoveling snow, right? So that's when you want to just prepare yourself. And if you haven't been in that position for a long or if you haven't been in that position often, it's no wonder that your body isn't prepared for it, right? So there's, there's lots of different ways that we can train ourselves that get us better prepared for when that moment does show up. So if it comes to changing posture, just, just move around. You can kick your feet up if what I tell patients, if you're reading a document on your computer or things like that, sit back, put your feet up. It's okay to lay like that for 10 minutes. You can come back to a Zoom chat, sit up nice and right so your face is actually in the camera, things like that. Um, really, really go a long way to reducing this, the repetitive strain on certain tissues, specifically like things like neck pain, headaches, and back pain when people are forced to sit at a desk for work. Okay, so not sure how much um, is going on in the chat, but if Meg, if you're okay with it, I'll keep going to the next one. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so <laughs> mobility versus flexibility. Um, before I say anything, what are your thoughts on the differences between mobility and flexibility? So if you'd like to share, go ahead, write in the chat. As you guys are doing that, I'll just this photo that I chose, it's not necessarily that she's practicing mobility or flexibility, but the number one thing I always ask patients is, how does she get on the floor? How did she get there? Did she get there with an aid? There's nothing around her. There's no chair. There's um, nothing that she used to help get herself there. This is sort of what I refer to as mobility is did you get yourself there or did it some sort of external force get you there, which is what usually people see when they think of stretching, right? They're putting, they're putting their body weight into it. They're, they're using a wall or the floor or something else to put pressure down into a certain range of motion that they're trying to achieve, whether it's neck pain and they're trying to crank their neck with their hand. There's always extra forces when people think of flexibility. 
Um, and it's not in every case, but when I think of mobility, I think of the strength it takes to get there. Right. And that range of motion that your joints are used to, like being able to cross your legs. I have lots of patients coming in, even in their thirties and they'll say, I can't cross my legs anymore. And that's probably just because they haven't crossed their legs in a long time, right? You have to be able to get into that position and do it a few times before you actually have that ability to do it on your own. So flexibility training is great, but if you don't know how to use it in your day-to-day -day life, it doesn't really serve much of a purpose. Um, and that's what I think, that's what I tell patients is try to focus on that mobility because that mobility is what gets you from point A to B. And with that ease, that strength that comes along with it. Um, and that's what keeps you independent. So a lot of times, whether it's going up and down the stairs, like my laundry is in the basement. I have to take my laundry from my upstairs all the way down to my downstairs. If I'm carrying my basket of laundry, I can't hold on to the railing. Am I able to go down the stairs by myself? Or is that a little bit too risky for me? Things like that, like building strength. This is all individual based, right? If you have a walking aid or anything like that, obviously those are things that we take into account when we're thinking about training you. Um, but there's little things like that or getting down on your knees. How quickly or how long might it take you? Or if it's uh, walking and turning around, how quickly can you get from point A to point B without dizziness or having to stop or things like that? Um, it's, it's little things like that, that every day can pose a challenge for someone. But if we practice those things, ideally those challenges become less and less uh, of a deterrent in our day-to-day -day life. And again, Meg is probably one of the best people to reach out to um, when it comes to being able to do things for yourself, like going up and down stairs and being able to have the strength to get off a curb like that, to cross a street, for example. I know that poses a challenge for a lot of people and same with the risk of falling, things like that. All right, I'll keep going here. Mm -hmm. So. Who has ever heard of hip hinging? And now I know this image is very specific to an actual replacement of a hip joint, but it was one of the images that I saw sort of, sort of showed um, what I'm trying to get at. So have you, have you heard of the difference between hinging and rounding of your back? So when we talk about rounding, most people refer to this as slouching or crouching. You think of that curve that accentuates that rounding forward. I'll, I'll mention it sort of like a turtle. Um, you're rounding forward through your spinal segments where the difference between hinging and rounding, instead of putting that pressure in through your spinal segments themselves, especially if you're outdoors, you're lifting heavy bags of, um, of garden soil or you're pushing a lawnmower or shoveling for that matter later in the winter, as we know here in Ottawa, there are different ways to redistribute forces that actually protect the back um, and hinging through your hips. And that refers to, if you think of a door hinge, right? It's bending through your hips as opposed to rounding through your spinal segments that can put pressure on tissues that aren't necessarily built for that sort of load, especially when we're carrying things. Um, so when it comes to that, we do a lot of coaching just to help people move. And then we show them, this is how you can incorporate it into very different activities. So we'll show people how to do it um, in what we'll say, like a shoulder length apart sort of position. But I show people how to hinge when they're lunging, where it's reaching forward, grabbing something that fell behind your toilet or things like that. But it's always that bending and twisting that people are often saying that that's what tweaks their back. That's what puts their back out. And it's those positions that are inherently untrained. <laughs> um, we don't often know how to pull very forcefully or lift something that's very heavy in these positions that typically put it at more at more risk. Now that doesn't say that, now I don't want you all to think that rounding is bad. Rounding is actually pretty good for your back because it increases mobility. So things like yoga um, and just regular mobility training, it is actually very good for your back because it helps your back um, gain the strength that it needs to. But in terms of all situations, there are different ways that we can be a little bit better at finding which position might be best for this activity. Um, so when it does come to lifting a heavy bag of soil or something along the garden or having to pull a tough weed, there are definitely certain muscle groups that are a lot stronger at pulling than just your, your back muscles. And a lot of times when it comes to lifting, I think of push the ground away as opposed to trying to lift with your back. And by lift with your back, I mean trying to bring that back back up 
um, just think about it as pushing with your feet. So push the floor away is usually what I'll, I'll tell people. Are there any thoughts about this guy? Have you guys been trained at all? Have you heard of these terms before? Um, every, most people are saying, no, they haven't. Um, so I was wondering if you'd be able to, someone's asking, could you visually show us the difference between hinging versus rounding? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I'm just going to, and hopefully everybody can see me in my little uh, camera there. So when we think about rounding, we'll think about sort of one of these, right? We'll bend over, pick up a pen, whatever it is. But when it comes to hinging, what I'm referring to is not necessarily your spinal segments rounding this way. Sorry, it's kind of hard to see with the dark chair behind me. Um, but when we talk about hinging, it's usually using your hip muscles. So down here to actually push your hips back. As a, And you'll notice that my spine actually never changed here. My spine here is the same as it was standing. The only thing that changed is I pushed my hips back and I used my glutes and my hamstrings to do that motion for me. And then my back just stays exactly in that same position that it was. So when it comes to pulling things like that, we're a lot stronger here than we would be here. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's, it all comes down to that sort of training aspect and making sure that we have the ability to know when and where to use those things. So when you're hinging, are you bending your knees a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So sorry. I know it's hard to see in the, in the, um, in the video here, but yes, you are bending your knees, but the knees are not the primary source of movement, if that makes sense. So what I'll usually tell patients is when you're learning to hinge, if you put a chair in front of your knees, your knees shouldn't track forward. So if your knees hit the, the chair, we're not necessarily hinging with our hips, but you're trying just, it's like you're trying to sit into a chair behind you as opposed to something that's right between your feet. A lot of times people try to bend as if there's something between their feet that they're trying to sit on. Um, and I usually just say, just push the, push the hips back. And I'll try to do that one more time here in the, in the video. I'll do it a little bit so you can see. So it's more here bending and you'll notice if you, it's hard to see, but my back actually stays over my feet. I'm not leaning forward right where my body weight now comes onto my toes and my balance gets affected but what you're doing is here right as opposed to rounding and putting ourselves potentially at risk for muscular injuries and things like that around here hmm. so what are some examples of when uh, hinging would be a better use of um, using your back so you were talking about lifting things yeah. so is that like gardening that sort of thing so gardening is a perfect example. If you're shoveling snow, it's another great one. Pushing with your glutes and your legs is a lot easier than having to lift that, especially if it's heavy snow with your back. Um, things like loading a dishwasher. Most people don't think about it, but it's something that it's something in front of you that you can't lean or go closer towards because that door does open, for example. Um, or things like... Um, carrying your or emptying the dryer from your laundry, for example, like there's little things like that, that require a little bit more, um, well, one mobility, um, but it does help to make things a little bit more efficient when it comes to movements and things like that. Um, because we're not, we're not necessarily built like robots, but we do have what we call biomechanics and mechanics don't lie. It's physics, it's general physics. Um, and the way the body works is we're working with rotational um, moments. So that's torsion or torque, if anyone's ever heard of those terms or worked with a, a wrench before. Um, typically, the, the further away something is, the easier it is to open. So what I'll always describe to patients is, have you ever noticed that the door handle is on the opposite side of the hinge, right? If you put the door handle right beside the hinges of a typical door that swings open and closed, it'll be really hard to open. It takes a lot more force to open something near the hinge than it does a little bit further away, which is what that, what two, two and a half, three feet, foot distance is that we typically have for most doors. It's because it's a lot easier, right? It's a lot easier to turn something the further away it is from the joint. And so for example, the, the, um, the biceps here, the reason our biceps is so good at bending our elbow is because of that tendon that pops out for us. It's a lot further from the joint compared to other muscles. 
right? So that biceps is mechanically very efficient at moving things. Um, and then there's really, really big muscles such as like your latissimus dorsi, which is just a big back muscle. Um, but he works on your arm and he's really, really big in people who have like, who do swimming, things like that throughout the summer, right? So it's understanding mechanics, things like that, that and education is one of the number one things that I do for people when they come in is helping them understand themselves. And that's usually the biggest feat is understanding themselves. And then it's like, okay, I understand why this exercise, why I'm doing this exercise, because it's going to help me with X, Y, Z. And usually we'll have that discussion with the patient to see why do you actually need this? What do you have trouble with at home? Awesome. Very, very helpful. Thank you. Okay. So next one. Okay, so this goes hand in hand with that hip hinging. Um, not to say that everybody's going to be a bodybuilder that goes to the gym, but it's the number one place that you might see it, that people are utilizing it, um, is a core brace or using your core abdominal muscles to stabilize your low back um, and your pelvic muscles so that when you're doing heavy lifting, um, uh, it, it actually helps save the back in terms of its mechanical efficiency um, and it actually gives you a solid base to pull or push or do anything from. Um, and this is something that I teach often with patients uh, because it is a foundational movement that they can use anywhere they are. So this is actually me working with a patient on abdominal bracing and just learning to one, first breathe with their stomach. That's the number one finding that I find that people often forget to breathe with their stomach. They start doing a lot of chest breathing and then they hold a lot of tension up in their shoulders. The number one thing I tell people, start breathing with your stomach, then we'll get to actually coordinating that with using your abdominal muscles um, to stabilize the low back. And by stabilize, I mean, if you've ever seen a telephone pole or anything like that, it has those guy wires that are pulling sort of an anchor to the ground from opposite directions. Why do you think those uh, poles are so stable? It's because of those guy wires. They're pulling in opposite directions. And if they're pulling in opposite directions, that pole can't go anywhere. It stays exactly right where it is. And that's the same idea I tell patients about their low back muscles, right? If you pull in every single direction, in opposite directions, the back can't go anywhere. It's very stable and you can actually start to use your hips to move through certain ranges as opposed to your back. Um, and a lot of that dissociation is something that we, we teach people with movement. Um, there's times where using your low back with your hips is great, such as golf, because I know a lot of people like to play golf. And then there's a lot of times where you, dissociating them is actually better for you. So again, it goes down to that, that gardening or even coming down to a squat, right? A lot of times I'll have patients tell me that uh, their back starts to hurt when they're doing a lot of gardening in their front or their knees start to hurt. Um, there's definitely very different ways to, to prepare yourself in that sense, to have that little bit of extra support for the back to keep it stable and by stable I mean not moving but then there's definitely other times where it's one of the best things you can do is move your back right so if you've been doing a lot of heavy lifting it can actually benefit you to move it around a little bit more and usually that's like something you do light load you're not holding anything very heavy you're just gently moving those joints through ranges of motion any other thoughts that I can sort of expand upon um, well, you talked about the importance of the core. So would you recommend as people are doing things like golfing, gardening, picking things up to, to, uh, tighten up those muscles? Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's, I would, uh, I would usually tell people is try both and see which one actually feels better to you. 99% of the time, the patient will say that bracing the core actually felt a lot easier. And that's usually because you've actually built that solid foundation that pulling from, if you think of pulling with a, or if you consider your body, we'll say like a limp noodle, like a cooked noodle, right? It's really hard to hold something still if everything is sort of moving around by itself, right? As soon as you stabilize and move it, you can isolate that movement to a particular joint or body region. And that's exactly what bracing does, is it redistributes things to make you mechanically more efficient for certain things. If you're doing yoga or playing on the ground with your grandchildren or um, doing like planting flowers for example, in the front yard, you don't need to brace. Those aren't necessarily um, moments where bracing is going to help you. But holding tension into your stomach is also another one that I teach for people when they're walking. And I'll get to another point later when it comes to walking. But walking is the number one exercise I prescribe for people. And they're like, really, that's my rehab. I'm like, 
yep, absolutely. But you're going to make these changes. Um, and walking is so foundational. And it's the number one thing with squatting that I will prescribe to almost every single patient if they have difficulty doing so. Because um, holding tension into your abdomen actually makes walking more efficient too. So it's not that we're maximally bracing, right? We're not trying to restrict movement entirely, but we're trying to control that movement. Um, instead of letting our bodies lead us forward, we're moving on top of our feet. And this is something I'll get into in, I think, next slide or another slide after that. Awesome. Yeah. On the topic of core, I do a lot of core exercises um, with my clients. And when I do presentations and I talk about, you know, fall prevention. And one of the main things to think about is having a strong core. Most people don't associate it as well. So, and it can help to reduce back pain. Um, but one of the little sayings that I started to share is tighten your core as you walk through the door tighten your core as you walk through the door. And the whole idea behind that is to get into the habit of tightening your core muscles. So I describe it like you're doing up a pair of tight pants. I know we all know what that feels like. Pull it in as you're walking through a door into another room and then relax your stomach. And then when you go into another door, do the same thing. And it's just building up that habit um, of activating those muscles. And over time, you'll start to notice, oh, I actually can do it easier. And your core may just kick in when you're doing other things. So uh, I wanted to share that because a lot of people find that, you know, when you start to think about building habits, um, you know, in, in easy ways, then it, it makes a, a difference in your life. That's an excellent point. Um, I love that walking through the door aspect, because it just it makes it routine throughout the person's day so that's another thing is when i'm teaching patients how to uh, hip hinge for example it's not that they have to stand there and hip hinge 20 times as their exercise right that gets monotonous it gets boring they don't really know why they're doing it or anything like that so what i'll tell people is if you drive a car perfect do you not that's okay do you ride the bus okay you do perfect we're gonna use that Every time you get on and off the toilet, which happens multiple times a day, every time you get in and out of your car or you use your desk chair, you're going to use your hip hinge. And that incorporates that hip hinge into their daily life a lot easier. And that's why you do the rehab. I don't care if you get good at the exercise, right? It's not about the exercise. It's about using what the exercise is trying to teach you in your day-to-day -day life, right? And that's exactly, I think, what Meg was sort of getting at is being able to activate your core, the more often you do it and the more natural it becomes, the easier it is. And your body will subconsciously start to use it because it starts to realize how much more efficient it actually is. Um, and it is great for, I don't want to say prevents injury because it's really hard to know exactly what prevents them, but it does reduce your risk, right? And reducing risk is something that we can sort of be confident in is there are certain mechanisms for injuries and that can be one of them is not using your abdominal core to stabilize the back for certain movements. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Good. All right. So this is probably one of my favorites, um, but patients immediately know exactly what I'm talking about. When I say, when I prescribe walking and walking is so incredibly great, specifically for knee, hip, low back, honestly, probably any condition of the body, but it is one of the most basic movements that we have as human beings. Um, it is what got us to where we are today in terms of being across the globe, because how did we get there? We walked, right? We became animals that walked on two feet as opposed to four, and that made us very mechanically efficient. And so our bodies naturally developed a way that made us be able to do this for hours on end. And this is why a lot of times when I ask people, oh, do you go for walks? They're like, oh yeah, I go for a 45 to an hour walk. And I'm like, that's amazing. Good for you. Because that's probably one of the best things that you can do for yourself is movement, right? What I love about walking specifically for low back pain is that it's cyclical. So one side turns on, the other side turns off and then it's the opposite. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. And guess what? The more repetitions you do, the better everything starts to feel. A lot of times people say that walking at the very beginning becomes late or it's a little bit stiff. It's hard to get going, but once they're going, they feel great. Um, and that's usually what I'll tell people is that because you're turning muscles on and off one, that's really good for the muscles because you're stimulating them, but it's also really good for your joints because you're actually moving them, right? You're, you're moving those joints throughout the entire body. So walking is not just your legs. It's not just your hips. It's your ankles, knees, hips, low back, upper back, because your arms are moving. It's your arms that are moving too. If you use walking as exercise, and this is what I always tell my patients, walk like you're late for something. 
and immediately people know exactly what they what I mean is that walk a little bit quicker and this is obviously not individualized to every single patient because if it's unsafe to do so, please do not. Um, but walking like you're late for something, what does it do? It activates more muscles, right? It takes a little bit more effort. You're more upright on your feet um, and you're actually using your body weight leaning forward to propel that momentum forward. And I always tell patients, trust your feet. Um, unless you have a movement uh, disorder or a con an underlying condition, which is very separate. That's why I say this is not medical advice, but usually using that momentum forward, I tell people, trust your feet and they, they'll, they'll go with you. Your body does not want to fall. So they will travel with you. Um, and that's one of the biggest things that I find. And what I kind of contrast that with is if you've ever been in a mall around Christmas time or when it's really busy, you see those um, what I call mall walking. And it's when people are typically leaning back, sinking into their hips and they're swaying side to side. Not my favorite style of walking, not to say that it's inherently bad, it's not. But if that's the type of walking you're doing for exercise, it might not be the best form for you just because you're actually using less muscles than you think you are. Um, typically our bodies are the master of disguise and they like to do things as efficiently as they can. And that can be in the sense of like a lazy way. Um, but when our, our hips are swaying side to side and that other side drops every time we're moving, and I kind of correlate that to um, like a fashion model walking down a, down a runway, she's trying to move her hips more side to side. Um, but that's actually not the best thing for our muscles, and especially our glutes. And when people have hip pain, it's the number one thing that's causing it is that extra strain on the hip joint that you're putting, as opposed to supporting yourself with those muscles. Um, so being more on top of your feet walking and a little bit quicker is a lot better for you in terms of rehab and even just that mobility aspect. And it will inherently build more strength and aerobic capacity. As we all know, cardiovascular fitness is the number one cause of death for us, unfortunately. And that includes strokes, heart attacks, things like that. So it's really, really important. You can do two in one. You can do exercise and cardiovascular fitness all in one. And it's no equipment necessary. You just need to be outside. Mm -hmm. Good way to enjoy the summer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I think that was, uh, yeah. So that's pretty much it in terms of uh, what I wanted to make sure that everybody saw. Um, but yes, thank you so much for having me, Meg. I, uh, I really, <laughs> I love sharing these things because a lot of times it's what people have never heard about, or they have these misconceptions that unfortunately have been updated or um, have changed as new research comes out. And it's num the number one thing that helps people is just understanding. And when you mm -hmm. have that understanding, it makes everything else make sense. And it's a lot easier to do something when you have that understanding, as opposed to just being told to do it. Um, mm -hmm. That never helps anybody. <laughs> no child ever wants to brush their teeth, but maybe if we tell them why they're brushing their teeth, they might want to do it. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Well, we've got some questions before we finish off. Um, the first question we'll, we'll hit is when gardening, what can I do to prevent low grade backache from spending a lot of time kneeling and leaning forward to weed? Okay. So when, when we talk about uh, being on your knees, so one, having something for your knees to support them. So if you actually are knee, oh, I don't know why that happened. Um, did my screen share just end? I'm it did, sure. yes. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> did we need it back or was that on? I perfect? think that's good. Yeah, I think we're okay. fine. Sorry, I, I did that. It was just so we can see both of you talking while you do the question and answer period, if that's all right. Yeah, so what I just saw someone shared is they use a kneeling pad probably the best thing you can do. Um, it puts, it disperses that pressure. So if you've ever worn shoes that are a little bit softer, um, what do they do for your feet? They make them feel good, right? So it's the exact same thing with knee pads. So oftentimes I'll say use a knee pad or a kneeling, um, uh, or a kneeling pad. Now, if you still get a backache, perhaps it's not the kneeling itself, but how long you're spending kneeling. Um, and a lot of times, time is that biggest variable of how long are we spending there or how often are you doing that position it could be a way to actually position you a slightly different way that actually offsets that load and that's another another thing that I often teach people is how to manipulate their pelvis so that their low back um, sees a little bit less strain um, and by that I'll show you again I'll stand so I can be here or I can sort of tuck my tailbone and untuck it, but that slight movement, I might feel great here for 10 minutes, but then after 10 minutes, oh, I want to be here and this feels a lot better. And then another 10 minutes goes by and this doesn't feel good, but then actually arching it a little bit more feels a lot better. 
So there's little things like that. It could be a micro movement that actually helps you keep going in terms of that activity. Or it could be that you do need to actually address a mobility issue through the hips because if bending is what's causing you the pain, maybe it's the knees, hips, or low back and dissociating or learning which joint needs to move more and which one might not want to move as much could be something to address. And that can be something that we do in an assessment for. So it's really hard to know exactly why you're getting pain with gardening, but um, that is one of those things. Um, is there anything else in terms of questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got quite a few. Um, there's two people who are asking if we're going to be demonstrating any back exercises. So maybe we can finish with that today. It'd be good to show a few. Um, someone else is asking, why are my glutes tight and painful? Mm. So glute tightness. And when people often come in, my, my muscle is tight and it hurts. Um, and people often, the first thing they go to is stretching. I'm not sure why we always thought that stretching a tight muscle, but I think it's just how things evolved in the fitness industry and healthcare, um, that stretching a tight muscle is what's going to alleviate that tightness. But I often ask patients, is, when patients ask me questions, I often answer with another question and because I want the patient to discover the answer for themselves. And so what I'll ask back is, um, why do you think the muscle is tight in the first place? right? Is it tight because it's protecting an injury? Is the whole muscle tight or only part of it tight? That could be a local injury, or that could be perhaps the nervous system is doing something to prevent um, a particular movement from happening. So a lot of times people will say that their hip flexors or the muscles that bring their knee towards their chest are tight. And then I, ask, I also ask them, well, how often are you moving your hips through an extended range of motion or training that movement to bring your knee towards your chest in a strengthening way? almost never. The only time we ever sort of move that knee towards our chest is if we're running, jumping, or going up and down stairs. But that's usually all body weight. We're not actually inducing a load to that. So what I'll usually tell people is instead of trying to stretch away a tight muscle, um, think about why it might be tight and consider perhaps it's trying to protect something. Perhaps it's not strong enough. And the, and the body's trying to actually protect itself. We hurt our shoulder. What's the number one thing we do is we hold our arm nice and tight and we elevate our shoulder towards our ear. I have no idea why the body decided that was good, but it's protective, right? It's keeping that shoulder from moving and our muscles will tighten up to keep that shoulder healthy. Um, so it's always little things like that to consider that perhaps there might be another reason as opposed to just simple muscle tightness from lack of movement. And I'll usually tell people is use that muscle in like a 10 rep sort of exercise and not strength, not stretching, but an exercise and see how you feel afterwards. Cause I can almost guarantee you it's going to feel better. Um, just because it's it's a very similar effect that happens when we open a jar of peanut butter we haven't opened in a while. And what do we have to do? We have to mix it around because it's gone kind of that oil layer on top and the bottom is kind of dried out and it's all stiff. We have to mix it around to get that peanut butter texture back so that we can actually spread it on our food. Um, and it's the exact same thing. It's it basically bonds that pa happen passively as something stays still for a long period of time. And the same thing happens in our muscles. I'm not gonna bore you with the technical definition of that. Um, but basically, if you move a muscle and you start using it, I can almost guarantee you it's gonna feel looser. Um, it naturally does because the body, and the easiest way to draw blood flow in, because for some reason, everybody thinks blood flow is gonna be the number one thing that cures everything um, to muscles. The easiest way to increase blood flow, it's not acupuncture, it's not cupping, it's not, um, what else is something else that people do? It's not that scraping technique that oftentimes people use like instrument assisted soft tissue stuff where it's like a metal tool you're gliding on the skin. The number one way to increase blood flow is actually using them. The body will increase blood flow to your muscles because you're using them, right? It's a form of preparation for exercise because the muscles now are like, oh, wow, we need oxygen. Let's, let's get more blood flow into there. And blood flow, as we all know, it creates heat. It creates that feeling of looseness, just like taking a hot shower makes us feel better. Hmm, awesome. Awesome. So many good tips here. Um, now, <laughs> two people have been asking about cramps. So mm -hmm. um, one person is asking, is there a relation between calf cramps and back? And then someone else is talking about getting cramps uh, when they sleep. Okay, so two very good questions. Again, very hard to know exactly why they're happening. Um, there are many, many, many conditions that have cramps as a side effect, as well as medications, right? Consider medications. If you've been newly prescribed something for whatever sort of condition, 
talk to your doctor about side effects. It could be on there as muscle cramps being one of them. Um, if you're, if you spent the whole day outside yesterday gardening in, in like a warm weather, have you gotten back your salt, right? You do a lot of sweating and hydration plays a huge role in muscle activity, as well as those ions like sodium and potassium that are great resources in bananas. Um, those are things to consider. When, when your legs are cramping sort of out of the blue, this one could be a good question for your physician. It could be a good question for your chiropractor or physiotherapist because there could be mechanical reasons for it. Um, but number one thing that I will often recommend people look into is magnesium supplementation. So if you're cramping while you're sleeping or at night, magnesium might be one of those supplementations that you can take that actually help with that sort of um, muscle cramping and twitching that we often see. Um, now, again, I can recommend a certain type of magnesium supplementation that we sell at our clinic, um, but it's always a good idea to get a second opinion from a physician and or a naturopathic doctor because that's their, that's their ball game, um, is to see what type of magnesium, because there are different types for different certain issues. So there's a magnesium that's really good for digestive upset, and there's a different type of magnesium that's really good for muscle cramps. So it's understanding which one will be the best one and understanding which brands. So it's not always gonna be the ones that shoppers that are the best for you um, in terms of their activity in the body. And sometimes finding out the quality brand is gonna save you lots of money in the future because you're not gonna be taking as much because that absorbency rate is a lot better and the higher quality of ingredients in the supplement. Okay, awesome. Um, Linda asks, should we tighten our core as we walk too? Does that essentially mean pulling in your stomach? Okay, so pulling in your stomach, almost like doing an inhale or trying to make yourself look thin or um, bringing that, um, belly button or navel in towards your spine. That's one way a lot of patients think that they're activating their core. It's getting one very particular muscle that's very, very deep. Um, and if you want to train that one, that's a great way to do it, but it's not the only muscle. We have uh, three to four layers of abdominal muscles and that's hitting one of them. Um, but the biggest one I also, I usually tell people is if you consider the same muscle activity you do when you cough, sneeze, laugh, um, strain on the toilet going number two, if you have any of those problems, those are the muscles we're trying to activate, right? And you, what you'll notice a lot of times when you activate those muscles, your abdomen actually gets bigger, not smaller, right? So it actually increases that circumference or that wraparound um, size of the abdomen. And you want to feel that rigidity throughout the abdomen. So you're going to feel your low back, your sides, and your front get activated. It's not just that inhale that makes your abdomen actually smaller. And the reason we actually wanna make it bigger is again, coming back to those moment arms or that mechanical efficiency of muscles. If we bring those muscles closer to our spine, we have less mechanical efficiency. The further we actually take it away, the, the more mechanical efficiency our muscles actually have on our spine. So actually increasing the size of our abdomen with that restriction. And I'll also sort of call it this, or describe it similar to like a car tire right? We have that rubber material. We want to inflate it to a certain degree or rigidity, but we don't want to keep going. We don't want it to be a balloon that keeps inflating, right? We want to hold that pressure in, right? And that's, that's what training it is like in terms of um, comparing it to a car tire. I say you want to increase pressure inside your abdomen, but maintain that rigidity. And that's a huge part of what we do in session where we will train people the individual aspects and then we bring it all together so patients can actually learn how to do it but when it comes to walking for example it doesn't have to be a maximal contraction just a little bit right it's like that we'll do 10 percent contraction of your abdomen it'll actually help aid that leg moving forward sort of motion as well as that counter rotation that tends to happen with our shoulders so as one leg goes forward the opposite shoulder goes forward right and it's that twist that's happening through our torso and that's the control that we're looking for awesome awesome um so much great information thank you dr christine so we're going to maybe tackle a few more and then i think it'd be great to end with a few demos of uh, some some back exercises we can do fit this in in five minutes yeah um, <laughs> someone is um talking about pole walking and using poles as they walk and i would say from my um my perspective that it definitely helps it adds um, adds more more work for your arms, and it really engages your core as well. Would you agree? It's it's good to walk with poles. 
Oh, I think it's awesome. Um, if people, I often see people who walk with poles, it's either winter time, right? So it definitely helps with balance because now you have that little bit of extra support um, that you otherwise wouldn't have. Um, but what it also does, as Beck mentioned, is it increases that mo the movement through your arms. Or if you're going hiking on uneven ground, sometimes it's actually nice to have that little bit of a, oh, just in case I lose my balance or the stepping is a little bit off. It really does help. Um, so yes, walking with poles is a great idea, especially if you do have underlying balance or strength issues. It's a great way to get started and keep moving. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And then the last question is, um, is this, is biking generally considered hard on the back? Um, in the most general sense, I would say no, it's not bad for the back or exerting too much effort on the back. But what I usually tell people is that if you're in that sustained posture for a long period of time, I would, um, and because it's that rounding posture, right? Because usually when people are cycling, they're trying to be aerodynamic in one way or another, um, that can put strain on the back, but it's not guaranteed right? Every single person will react to cycling differently. If you inherently already have pain with bending forward, that might not be the best activity for you. If you have something like lumbar spinal stenosis, for example, which is a condition, in a degenerative condition on our low back that can affect your ability to walk and things like that, bending through your low back is actually one of the best things for you. So I'll tell people who have lumbar spinal stenosis, um, cycling or doing stationary cycling, not necessarily on a road bike, but stationary cycling, probably one of the best ways to maintain their muscle mass in their legs and um, alleviate their back pain because you're actually opening up some of those joints in the back that help with that nerve function that typically gets affected. Um, so cycling, depending on the person, it can be great. Other people can give them problems and that's okay. We can either find a way that cycling works for you or find a different activity. Um, it's really up to the person and how much they're willing to, I guess, sacrifice or put the work into continuing an activity that they want to be doing. So inherently, no, it's not bad. Um, it's just understanding that if you're in that flex posture for a while, move the opposite direction once in a while. <laughs> it's always good for you to stand up, walk around, take a break. That's also okay, but you can always keep cycling. I think you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm just looking at the time. I know that you have a patient um, at 11, so we'll let you go. But before everyone else leaves, I'll demonstrate just a few exercises for your back that you can do. Um, and yeah, getting comments. Thank you everyone for joining in um, and stay to the end because I'll talk a little bit about the fitness membership that you guys can join if you're feeling really inspired to get moving. because I know that I am. So thank you, Dr. Christine Rad, for your amazing advice today and for being our guest. This has just been so, so good. I know that people have really enjoyed and uh, it's been very, very hands-on, hands-on uh, information for all of us visual learners as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I do always try to make things make sense. So if it ever doesn't make sense, always ask, right? I don't know what people don't know. <laughs> um, but it's, it's always helpful to understand things in a way that patients can actually relate to. So I'll show them an activity that they do in their day to day life. And they're like, Oh, now I get it. So it's, it's usually one of those kind of aha moments that really gets that exercise. And they're like, oh, I, this will be easy. I know exactly when and where to use it, things like that. Um, so please reach out if you ever have any questions. I know they'll give you my contact information. And I am here in Ottawa. And we do have a great clinic where we have so many different variety of um, offerings that we have. Um, and we do huge, huge work on collaborative care at our clinic. And we do have specialty programs that help people with specific conditions. Um, and we do, uh, so yes, please reach out. We are a resource for you, even if it is just information. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. So before everyone heads off, I'm going to demonstrate a few stretches um, that you can do. So the first one that you, you can do, you can join me for this one because Muscle memory, we tend to learn better when we do something. So this one is good to improve your posture. So if you do find that you've been sitting, maybe slumped over for quite a while, um, you can reach those arms right in front of you. Look straight ahead, just like you're going to sh shake someone's hand and then bend your elbows and squeeze your shoulder blades back. All right, so come join me and make sure you're sitting away from the back of your chair. So you have some space. So you'll find that your elbows here, I'll stand like this, reach and then bend those elbows, squeeze back. All right, so we'll do this five more times, squeezing back, notice right between your shoulder blades, feeling that tightening happening. 
All right, we'll do four more. Remembering to breathe as well. And three. Good. And two. And one. All right, now the next one you can do, um, Dr. Christine was talking about changing, changing the positioning of our back and quite often doing the counter uh, movement is really important. So what I would suggest you do and join me for is the cat and cow. So I'm gonna angle my camera down a little bit here. So we're gonna start by rounding your back. So this one is the cow. You can look down, place your hands here on your knees rounding what she was talking about and then we're going to arch your back so bring your shoulders back looking up so if you've done any yoga classes you've probably done lots of cat and cow i see a lot of people nodding along oh yeah is this familiar but this is a seated um, option because not everyone is comfortable going on the floor and um, in the fitness videos that I have in my membership a lot of them done are done most of them are done on a chair or standing and um, we do have some, some uh, exercises on the ground as well. But I know a lot of people like the option to do things from a chair. All right, so let's do it two more times. So again, rounding your back, look down, really feel that spine, getting a great stretch here. And arch, good. And then one more time, rounding. Good. And then arching that back, good. Now, if you're not sure what you're doing, if it's right, I often recommend doing it in front of a mirror. So you can do this exercise where you're rounding, arching, and then straightening your back as well. And I also recommend that, uh, that other exercise where you're hinging from your, your hips instead of rounding your back. Do that one as well, facing the side, looking into uh, standing in front of a mirror. So again, you can see, what am I doing? Because sometimes it does take us a little bit of time to get uh, comfortable with those motions. Uh, so if some of you are feeling very inspired and very excited about moving, I know I am, we had some really great tips this morning, um, be sure to check the link that uh, Antoine will send out tomorrow to learn more about um, the membership. So my fitness membership has been designed for adults 50 plus and retirees who are wanting to improve their strength, their mobility, and want to see their health improve. So I've put together videos that are 15 to 30 minutes. So very short, you can fit it into your day really easily. Um, and they're all different. So if you get bored easily, if you have specific goals, like improving your balance, um, like improving your upper body strength, your posture, um, maybe you're wanting to improve that mobility or flexibility, you're going to love the videos. So be sure to check it out. You guys do have a 33% discount and I offer both a monthly, three month, six month, and then a full year membership. So you can check it out and join me this summer. All right, well, we'll wrap it up here. Thank you everyone for participating. I know we didn't get to all of the questions.